Hey, good morning. morning. Good to see you. It really is. It is great to see you this morning. If you're visiting with us, we want to thank you for coming. Uh, My name is Kenny Todd. I am the lead pastor at Grace City Church. Uh, Real quickly, uh, let's just real quickly, I, I feel the need to do this because he puts up with a lot of a lot of my mistakes. Uh, I want you to give it up for uh, my brother-in-law, Jason Harbour, and all the communion people, please. (laughs) Because, you see, they are probably the only communion team in the country that has to stay on their toes. Because in the eight months, that nine months, however long we've existed right now, uh, that we've existed as Grace City Church, I think we have changed the order up on them like six times. At least. you hear that? They said at least. So, yeah, Jason, once in a while, he'll be like, hey, so when are we doing it this week? I'm like, I don't know, Harps. So anyways, I do appreciate those guys and all that they do. Um, I do remember, want to remember to announce this uh, because if I don't, Michelle, when she comes back, will be very mad at me. Uh, on, uh, I hope I get this date right, I believe it's May 21st, we're going to have a congregational meeting immediately following church, okay, uh, we have to take a vote on changing some of the wording in the bylaws that the, the state wants us to change, and so we need to do that, and the only way we can change things in our bylaws is through a congregational vote. So if you could be here for that uh, after service, that'd be wonderful. And the last thing I want to say is this, is in the back, raise your hand, Aaron Holsey, okay, Aaron Holsey, our brother over there, he's, uh, he goes to uh, Rock Church in town. And one of the things I want us to be is I want us to be a church that is about the church. Okay? I really do. I want us to be a church that is about the church. And, uh, you know, it's not us against them. It's all us on one team for one Jesus against one enemy. Okay? And that's who we are, and that's who we always want to be. And so he goes to the Rock Church, uh, attends there, and uh, him and his family. And But they are going on a mission trip this summer. And I want to invite you to go back and talk to Aaron, find out what that's about. And if you can contribute and, and, and help them financially a little bit, uh, they would greatly appreciate it. And I would love for us to do that as a church for them. Or if you just want to grab them and pray for them, that would be awesome too. So go ahead and do that after church um, today. All right, um, well, here we go. Here we go, guys. We are beginning a new series today uh, out of the book of Jonah, and we are calling it A Fishy Story of a Wayward Prophet. Uh, I am so excited about uh, this new series. Um, When we look in the book of Jonah, we meet a a Hebrew prophet named Jonah who was given a word by the Lord. And that word, okay, church, that word was for him to leave his land in the northern kingdom of Israel and to go over to a city called Nineveh. And he was to go over there and to preach out against its wickedness and to kind of warn them about the wrath that God would put on them if they did not turn from their wickedness and turn to God. And so as most of you probably know the story, you don't even really have to be a church attender to know the story of Jonah. So as most of you know, Jonah, when given the word, does not go to Nineveh, in fact, does the complete opposite. You see, instead of traveling from his home to the northeast to the city of Nineveh, Jonah decides to try to escape the all-present God, and he instead heads south to the city of Joppa which is a a, a, a seaport city. And in that seaport city, he then boards a ship, okay, headed across the Mediterranean Sea 
to a town called Tar Tarshish, which is a town located on the southern tip of Spain. So instead of going east, he goes west. And some of us know what that's like when God calls us. He calls us to something over here, and we're like, uh, no, I think I'll go this way. We've all been there. I know we have. And so what happens is Jonah gets on the ship, and he heads across the Mediterranean Sea, and through some events that we'll talk about later, Jonah ends up getting thrown overboard into the sea, right? And so he's in the sea, and he's... Uh, on the brink of drowning, of losing his life. And, and it's at this moment where Jonah's like, oh man, this isn't really what I wanted to happen. Okay? And so the, the, the waves are crashing. Jonah's about ready to drown. And God rescues Jonah through a great fish. Not a whale, church. It's not a whale, okay? Just so we're on the same page. It's a great fish. Or can be interpreted a great sea creature. So Jonah is rescued by this great fish. He's swallowed up and he lives and he kind of chills. If you can chill in the belly of a fish. he ch That's funny, guys. You're killing me out there. That is funny. He chills in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights. And while God has him there... God speaks to Jonah, and Jonah kind of comes to his senses. And after that happens, the, 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 I almost said whale, the great fish, the great fish throws Jonah up onto the dry land, okay? And when he throws up, Jonah's like, okay, we're not going to do this again. I'll just do what you said. So reluctantly, we'll learn later, reluctantly and with a hard heart, Jonah then heads to Nineveh, where he indeed does preach against the wickedness of Nineveh and the people there. And in his preaching, the people of Nineveh do in fact turn from their wickedness and turn to God for a while. But I want to share something with you real quickly that most people don't realize. You see, even before Jonah had arrived in Nineveh, God was already at work. And I'm going to tell you this. Even when God calls you to do something difficult, when he calls you to share your faith, when he calls you to start something new, when he calls you to stand up for what he calls you to believe in, when he calls you to tell someone about Jesus, church, we shouldn't be fearful. We shouldn't be afraid. We should be confident in that God is already at work in that situation before we show up. And I'm going to tell you something that for some of you, you may not realize this, but even before Jonah showed up in Nineveh, I believe God was at work. We don't read it in the scriptures, but you see, it is historically accurate to say that it has been found in the Assyrian records. Nineveh is an Assyrian city. It is accurate to say that before Jonah showed up, God had put some things into play to prepare their hearts, to soften their hearts, to receive the message from Jonah. And the things that we found that were in play are this. Number one, we know for a fact that during that time prior to Jonah showing up, there was a solar eclipse. Records have shown there was a, there was a solar eclipse that time prior to Jonah showing up. That would have been huge. That would have been huge. But even beyond that, we know that the king, well, there's still debate. After I've looked at it, I think it's true. The king of Assyria at that time was a man, I'm probably going to say his name wrong, called Asherdan III. And Asherdan III was one of the weakest, most soft-hearted leaders of the Assyrian Empire ever. So in other words, he was a big chicken. He didn't hold up to the, to the, to the 
what the average Assyrian leader would have been, which is a big bully, he was pretty much a chicken compared to the rest. So you got the solar eclipse. Then we also know based on records that at that same time there was an earthquake that hit. An earthquake that hit. Okay, you follow me? I got a big chicken leader. I got a solar eclipse. And I got an earthquake. Again, that's funny. <laughs> then we also know that during that time that they experienced a famine. So now they don't have food. And we know, according to the Syrian records, that at that time, a plague hit the area. Yeah. So all this happens, and here comes Jonah. <laughs> hey, guys, you're wicked. And God wants you to turn. By now, they're probably on their knees going, oh, please, anything, anyone, we'll do anything. Can we just change the course of our history? So God was at work even before Jonah showed up. Church, listen to me. One of the most fearful things we do as a Christian. Listen, if I were to say, hey, we're going to take up an offering today. Many of you would be glad to do it. If I were to say, hey, we're going to go do some work over in Bourbon or over in Seoul, many of you would be glad to do it without an ounce of fear. But when we start to talk about evangelizing, when we start talking about ta telling people about Jesus, when we start talking about sharing our faith, and I'm not, it, it's a perfect natural kind of a feeling, but we immediately become fearful. We immediately become frightened. And what we need to do, church, is in those moments, we need to immediately become confident because we serve, we worship, and we share, and we tell of a God who prepares the stage way before we show up. Guys, we do not serve a God that is sitting on his hands and just telling us to do. We serve a God that journeys alongside us allows us to do work on his behalf for his kingdom. But he works with us. We do not serve a God that sits idle. We serve a God that is active and is preparing the stage for the church to go out and to proclaim his glory. Amen? Amen. 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 So, but before we... Before we uh, jump in to the book of Jonah and begin to pick apart the verses and the chapters and the themes of the entire book, okay, there are three things that I want us to know today that I believe if we walk away today understanding these three things, we will have a better appreciation for the book of Jonah. We will better understand the journey of Jonah. And we'll better understand what the book of Jonah has to say to us today. And the first thing I want us to understand is this, okay, is that I want us to understand the authenticity of the book. It's very important because let's, under, let, let, let's just come to this fact that the book of Jonah, by many circles, is seen as a fictional book. No, it is seen as not being true. It is seen as a lot of things, but it is not seen as a historically active, historically true book, okay? One of the things some circles would say it is, is they would say that it is a parable that Jesus, like Jesus used to use. It is a, a, a lesson to, it is, a, it is a, a, a book, sorry, a book to teach a greater lesson. But here's the problem with that. The problem is that parables, by definition, are extremely short. Maybe, definitely one scene, maybe two or three at the most. But a parable never is four chapters long. Never. A parable ultimately points to something, a lesson, uh, its elements point to a lesson or something outside of the story itself. 
Jonah, the book of Jonah, is all about the actions of Jonah, who is inside the story. So, folks, what I'm trying to tell you is it does not at all follow the pattern of a parable. Some people, now I got to make sure I say this right, and you are more welcome to correct me if I, 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 I struggle with this one. Some people think it's a midrash. Anyone know what that is? That basically is a commentary on a section of the Old Testament scriptures. So in other words, it's a, it's a, it's a writing or a letter or a book that explains a text in a way that you and I can understand it back in, those, back in that period. Today, we just call them commentaries. I read commentaries to help me understand different parts of the Bible because I'm not smart enough just to read it and just understand it. I have to have really smart people tell me how to interpret it so then I can turn around and interpret it to you. So what's that say about you? <laughs> just saying. You're like the fourth person down the line. <laughs> I love y'all if you're visiting. Some people, but the problem is, is that it does not at all, it does not all, there is no evidence whatsoever that it is about or, 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 or simplifies another book of the Old Testament. Some people would call it an allegory. An allegory, which is a fictional story about a deeper truth. And it is not at all an allegory. You see, here at Grace City Church, in our leadership, we do not take on any of those understandings of the book of Jonah. We do not believe those at all. We, in fact, believe that it is true. We, in fact, believe that, is a, that it is a prophetic narrative, that it is a book of historical events that actually happened, that Jonah was an actual prophet who actually prophesied against the wickedness of Nineveh. We believe that Jonah was swallowed by a great fish, and you would say, come on, Pastor Kenny, really, a great fish, swallowed a man, and the man lived in the fish. Do you hear what you're proclaiming, what you're saying, what you're teaching? I do. I do. And listen to me. This is what I have to say to those who would doubt it. I want to go back to last week, Easter week, when we talked about the power of God. Amen. And I'm going to say this, that the God that created the world and all that is in it, the God that took dust and made man, I have a feeling is not very challenged by taking a man and put him in the belly of a great fish and allowing him to survive. You see, that's the God that we worship. That's the God that we follow. That's the God that we believe in. And that's the God that I'll teach about. You see, this is the God. If, 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 if the God that you pray to if the God that you sing to, if the God that you live for, if the God that you talk about, if the God that you worship, if the God that you proclaim is not a God that is powerful enough, powerful enough to put a man in the belly of a fish and allow him to, to survive for three days and three nights, then folks, you are not worshiping the God of this Bible. It is your own God. That is a made-up God. That is a, fig, a fictional God. That, in fact, is a false God. Because you see, the God of the Bible, he is not limited in power. He will not be boxed in by our limited understanding of who he is. The God of the Bible is greater than our finite understanding. He is bigger than our worldly perspective. He is beyond our philosophical and theological understandings. And he is more powerful than you and I will ever comprehend. You see, that is the God who put Jonah in the belly of a fish. And that is the God who extended his grace beyond the borders of Israel into the city of Nineveh. Amen. Yes, in church, we worship that God. Amen. We celebrate that God. But as we celebrate that God, we have got to remember 
that God is going to call us beyond the borders of Grace City Church. Do you hear me? Do you hear where I'm going with that? God calls us to move beyond these walls, beyond that parking lot, to take our faith to our communities and know that as we do that, he is preparing the way, softening hearts, setting the stage for us to do great things for his glory and advancement of his kingdom. Amen. Amen. I hope you believe that. The next thing I want to tell you about is the city of Nineveh. The city of Nineveh. You see, we first hear about the city of Nineveh in Genesis chapter 10, verse 11. I want to read that for you, just so you know I'm not lying. It says, um, it's it's basically talking about how the founder of the city of uh, of Nineveh, uh, how he found, he he was also, he began uh, the the empire, the Babylonian empire, and they're going and talking about the, the cities or the territories that he started. And he said, from that land, he went to Assyria where he built Nineveh. He says a couple other towns too, but I can't pronounce them, so I'm not even going to. think you can laugh at me. I laugh at myself all the time, especially when I'm out there trying to say it. But that is where we first hear about the great city of Nineveh. And its founder, as mentioned in Genesis 10, is a man named Nimrod. (laughs) Go ahead, laugh at that one. I know, right? I read it and I just laugh every time. It's like the lady with the Chewbacca mask. Have you guys seen that video? Yeah, like I read that name and I just go on and on and on and on. Okay, so founded by a guy named Nimrod, who actually was the son of Cush. Check this out. The grandson of Ham. Okay. But he was, which makes him the great grandson of, anyone know? Of Noah, of Noah. That's where we get Nineveh. You see, Nineveh was a great city. It was the capital city of Assyria and was known for a population of 120 plus thousand people. It was a very strong, very powerful, very aggressive, militant capital city they were it was full of of pagans pagan gods it was full of wickedness and it despised israel hated israel they were bullies to israel It was, it, 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 Nineveh, maybe this will help you. Nineveh is actually located in the area of modern day, and I'm going to say this wrong, and I've told my small group this, so you guys can help me, of Mosul, did I say it right? Iraq, did I say it right? Did I say it? Mosul, 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 Iraq. Okay, that is the area that Nineveh is. And I'm, and, and, and in the words of one of my favorite preachers, okay, Mark Driscoll, He says this. He says, hey, if you want to give Jonah a hard time, he says, do this. Put on your favorite Christian t-shirt. Put on your Make America Great Again hat. Go over to Mosul, Iraq. Pull ISIS together and the Taliban. And when you get them together, say, guys, what you're doing is wrong. And if you don't stop, you're going to go to hell. That's the equivalent of you and I doing what Jonah was called to do. But church, I will say this. There's going to be times in your life and in the life of this church that God calls us to difficult places to do difficult things. To do sometimes dangerous things. To step out into a place where we're not comfortable. To put something on the line. Maybe it's our finances. Maybe it's our reputation. Maybe it's our children. Maybe it's our life. 
I don't know. But I do know that God will call you and this church to step up in our faith and do the difficult things that others are not capable or may not willing to do. And my prayer, Grace City Church, is that we still remember we are about a church that is beyond these walls and about going and doing the difficult things that God calls us to do. We will lead the way. We will set the standard. We want to be exactly who God calls us to be and go where he calls us to go. The third thing I want you to know about the book of Jonah before we actually dive right in next week is this. I want you to know a little bit about the person of Jonah. You see, the person of Jonah was a Hebrew prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel between around 786 B.C., 746 B.C., depending on what you read. There's different ideas. Uh, heck, one of them even had him dead by 746. I don't know. So it's right around there, right around that 786, 746 is when he uh, preached and prophesied uh, for the uh, northern kingdom of Israel. And we first meet Jonah is in the book of 2 Kings 14, 2 Kings 14, verse 25. And it says this, it says, he was one, now this is talking about King Jeroboam II, but hold on. He was one who restored the boundaries of Israel, talking about uh, Jeroboam II, from Lebo Hamath to the Dead Sea, in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, here we go, spoken through his servant Jonah of Amittai, the prophet from Gath Hefer. The reason I share that is this, church. The only other time in the Old Testament that we hear about Jonah outside of the book of Jonah is in this text. And what we learn from this text is this. While in that time, in that time, let me make sure I get the right people. In that time, the prophet Hosea and the prophet of Amos were, uh, were calling out against the wickedness and the corruption of Israel. Jonah was preaching blessing into the nation of Israel. And he was doing it during the time of King Jeroboam II. And during the time, what we know is this, is during the time of King Jeroboam II, is that the nation of Israel, the nation of Israel actually began to take back and, re, and reclaim some of the property that it had lost to other, to other, other nations. And so the walls and the boundaries for Israel were beginning to expand. They were experiencing some blessing from God. And all while this is happening, the prophet who is speaking this, who is preaching about this, who is, who is kind of talking about this and coming along Jeroboam II is Jonah. And the reason that's important is because this is what I think happened. And some people may argue with me, but I get in an argument every day. So this is what I believe happened is Jonah was in a place to where he was enjoying so much success that he was under, he was, he was in a place where he was so liked that he had become so comfortable with his life. And then one day, God called him to do something. But the problem was, Jonah had enjoyed such a comfortable life compared to other prophets that his heart had grown so hard to doing the difficult thing. God called Jonah to go to Nineveh. And in his comfort and in his place of peace and his place of luxury, He went the other way. His heart had grown hard to those 
who did not feed into the life that he had. Grace City Church, this is very important for us to understand. Because when you look around, you look around this building, you look at what happened over Easter, praise God, we had 674 people come in to hear the to, to worship that day and to hear the, the gospel message. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. To the glory of God. But listen, church, there's danger in that. The danger is that we begin to look at what God is doing through us and we become comfortable. We become, hey, look at us. Look how good we're doing. I've heard it said. And we want to give God all the praise for all the things that happen. But listen, we do not, Grace City Church, we do not ever, no matter how much success, quote unquote success, worldly success as far as numerical numbers and stuff like that, no matter where God blesses us, we never ever, Grace City Church, want to become so comfortable that we stop reaching beyond these walls, beyond the parking lot, into the places that scare us, into the places that seem dangerous, and sharing the love of Jesus with those who are in their darkest hours. Grace City Church, I am begging you. I am pleading with you. Let's celebrate what God is doing, but let's never, ever stop caring for those beyond this parking lot who need to know the love of Jesus. Let's not stop being who God calls us to be. And I mean this from the bottom of my heart. Please, please, for the sake of his kingdom, for the sake of God, for the sake of Jesus, for the sake of the mission that he has us on, let's never become too comfortable. Never. Let's continue to be who God calls us to be. Let's continue to love and to reach into all corners of our communities. I'm going to pray, and then after I pray, we're going to dismiss. And you guys, if you have questions, if you want to be prayed for, if you want to talk about uh, committing your life to Jesus, uh, I'm going to be up here. I'm going to ask our elders, Grady and Mark uh, and Chris, if they're in here to come up here. I really want you guys to come up here, be available for that. And I'm going to ask uh, Stefan as well for about 10 minutes. And uh, you can come up, grab one of those guys, and, and they'll love to talk with you and pray with you. I'm going to pray, and then, uh, and then you're going to be dismissed. God, thank you. Thank you for uh, the things that we can be taught by looking at the life of Jonah. But God, at the same time, help us to be different than Jonah was in that season. God, help us to be a church that is constantly aware of what is going on beyond this parking lot, that is constantly willing to love those who are in the darkest place. Be constantly available to those who are struggling. God, our prayer is that we'd be a church that constantly honors you and elevates the name of Jesus and loves people on your behalf for one reason and one reason only. Your kingdom. They would come to know you. They would come to know your son. They'd, become, they'd come to know the Holy Spirit and they'd become part of your kingdom. God, help us to be a church that stays focused, ready, and willing to go wherever and to say whatever you need us to say and to love on whoever you need us to love on. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.